Good morning, all genders. Good morning, Hacklew. You all look, uh, I was going to say bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, but you look like maybe you haven't had enough coffee. Are you awake? You ready? We have a lot of slides to get through. It's going to be very dense. This talk is, um, it's a mixture. It's a mixture of economics, uh, a little bit of reverse engineering, blockchain, chasing payments, analyzing payments, and insurance. And I know insurance gets you all awake, right? You're all like super excited about insurance. Doing uh, cyber insurance puts you in a special status somewhere between like a uh, rock star and a uh, fighter pilot, right? No? Okay, you don't even want to laugh early in the morning? It's too early. Okay, we'll just do the dry academic version of the presentation then. That's, uh, I guess that's what they want, so we'll see. So I'm Aaron Leverett. I'm at the Cambridge Judge Business School, and I also run a company called Consumzy Risks. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to Hack Alley. It's my first time, so if I make a blunder, please pardon. Uh, I'm Ankit Gangwal. I'm a PhD student at the University of Padua. I am the final year, I'm in, a, in my final year. Hopefully, I will graduate this year. And well, let's see where we take you through. Yeah. I hope you will like the presentation. So this is the overall uh, introduction to the presentation. We are going to this, do through these points. And we have a couple of slides here. First, we are going to introduce, I think we already have done it. Yeah, they don't, they don't want to see the table. Okay, contest. just one more thing I would like to say about myself is that I do research in, I started with my network security, but right now I'm focusing on cryptocurrency and crypto mining, both legal and illegal crypto mining. And apart from this, I believe in repro reproducible research. So if you want to, if you go to my webpage, you will find source code and data set, whatever you would like to reproduce my results. I want to reiterate that. Like I contacted Ankit because of a chance uh, misp correlation. So like I was doing a bunch of research and my research correlated with his research and then I contacted him. And some of you will know you contact an academic researcher and go, can I see some of your data? And they're like, oh, uh, maybe I'll get around to it later. But he, he genuinely gave me access to the data and was really open about his research. And he'd done better research than I did. So if you can beat him, join him, right? So here we are. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a weird little introduction to insurance because I know it's super boring, but I want to use it as a framework for this talk. So I was in uh, Norway a few years ago. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, a hackerspace in Norway called Hackeria, so greets to them. And uh, when I was there, there was a talk uh, from some people from Sweden. And they came in and they basically said, we believe that transport should be free. You should be able to ride the subway uh, in Sweden for free. Um, and the state doesn't uh, agree with this, right? So they have these little barriers and they have little cops that go around checking to see whether or not uh, you have a ticket on the subway. And this organization came in and said, okay, it's like 100 sec to buy a day ticket. These prices aren't right, but I'll just give them as a rough example. And it's like 1,000 sec uh, if you get fined, right? Um, okay, these barriers aren't so effective. We can just walk past them and we can hope that we don't get caught. What is the ratio at which the police actually catch people with tickets? Because if we sit down and we do the math, maybe we could pay 50 sec per day, and then anyone who gets caught will pay their fines, right? And then a few of the people who were doing this were kind of, uh, you know, making fun of the cops as they went past, and so they got caught more frequently, and the scheme didn't work so well. So they introduced uh, what the insurance would call a deductible. So you paid like the first 50 of the thousand fine, uh, but they paid the rest, right? And the scheme is still going. And the goal is to show people that you could have transport for free. Like you actually spend more money enforcing tickets uh, being used on the, on the subway than you do, um, uh, than you would pay if you wanted everyone to have free access to the subway, right? Now, obviously these kinds of schemes work in places where they don't shoot people for getting on the subway. Um, I say that as someone from Britain. It doesn't happen very often, but, uh, occasionally. So, you know, this might not work for you in different countries depending on whether or not it's legal. Um, but I think, I think it's a very interesting example of what insurance is like, right? Most people think insurance and they think huge capitalism, you know, big companies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I love this. These people sat down and did the mathematics of how likely they were to get caught on the subway to give people free rides on the subway. And that's the kind of math that I think is really cool. So I want you to keep this in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. Essentially, this presentation is about I'm a huge fan of uh, socialized medicine, and I wonder if it's possible for ransomware to be treated in this way. Could we pay for this to be treated? Anyone who comes to us uh, with a ransomware infection, 
Uh, is it possible? What would the mathematics look like? Can we afford it? So um, a little bit more about insurance. If you don't insure, you self-insure, right? So lots of people hate the idea of paying a big insurance company. That's fine. But that means you put aside some money for a rainy day by yourself. And if not money, then you put aside some grain or you put aside some electricity or you put aside something, right? Um, so we're going to talk about risk models. And the other complaint I hear mostly about insurance is that uh, it would eat into my security budget. That's true. If your security budget only involves uh, prevention and response, then fine. Let's just compare with what they'll offer us with what, uh, with what we do for ourselves, right? That's the, the basic idea. Um, all right, we'll skip this. This is the boring stuff. Um, this is boring too. Does anyone in the room not know what ransomware is? We're happy to answer for you. If you know, okay, good. We'll move on. We have good slides. So everyone understands the basic premise of ransomware and the infection life cycle. We're going to use this as a, as a, you know, we know that you know this stuff. We're just using it as a sort of definition for the purposes of this talk. We're not going to get into massive discussions about the difference between a locker and a wiper and a crypter, right? Like that's not the purpose of this discussion. It's a little bit more about economics and so on and so forth. All right. So ransomware lifecycle. Okay. Uh, so the first phase is the infection and how ransomware spreads. So I'm going to go very f quickly from these for these slides. It's like, first thing, they send spam emails, some drive-by downloads or software updates. In spam emails, they generally say, okay, this is a customer complaint for your company, and they're going to put some links there. And if, some, if one of the employee hits the button, then probably it's going to enter in the company. Drive-by downloads, for example, in CryptoVault, they send mixed facts decoy, and they probably... they. The link, the link was to download the, the malicious payload. And for NotPetya, was distributed as an update to Ukrainian software called MeDoc. So these are some of the things that we discovered when we were researching about these things. Another thing that they do is the backdoors, like WannaCry did to use Double Pulsar backdoor and some installers in BadRabbit. Interestingly, they also offer you affiliate programs. So if you help us in spreading ransomware, we are going to pay you like 5%, 10%, 50%, depending upon how much you spread our ransomware, which was especially with uh, um, this guy, Janus. If you know, if, if you work in ransomware, you know who Janus is. So. All right. So everyone knows that ransomware first started in 1989, right? No. You really don't want to interact this morning. Okay. All right. So, yeah, there was a HIV AIDS researcher who was trying to get across the point that uh, you get this disease and then big uh, companies charge you a ransom to get yourself as healthy as possible and to live as long as possible. And that's kind of crazy. So here's this stunt. I'm going to infect your computer with, like, I'm going to offer some software that helps you do some risk assessment of HIV patients or potential HIV patients. And then when your computer reboots 90 times, you're going to get this message saying that you need to send a banker's check to Ecuador or Panama or something, some tax haven. Um, and, uh, you know, this was a stunt. Uh, I believe the researcher served time for it because it was a virus and it's uh, illegal. Um, but that was 1989, before the blockchain really existed. The thing that we think is really funny as we're going through this is that we found a cash out uh, from CryptoLocker from 1972. So uh, the QR code there uh, takes you to the blockchain uh, example if you want to go and have a look. Um, we were surprised. We know that the 1972 timestamp is false. Like, it must be false. Why would it be in there? It's the received time for blockchain enthusiasts amongst you. Um, but we still think it's pretty cool and it's interesting. So if some people have some ideas about why there are blockchain received times uh, in the 70s, I mean, some of our ideas are anti-forensics, right? You might do this on purpose because when someone goes to look through a bunch of transactions, they're not going to look that far back in time. That might be one reason. Uh, it could be a parsing error on behalf of blockchain uh, info or .com. That was suggested by a few other people at MISP uh, and Circlu. Um, you had some other ideas too about why it might be there. Probably it's a time warp attack. Maybe. Do you know about that? Yes. I mean, we were looking at time warp attacks. I think uh, it's better we explain it here. Yeah, go ahead. So time warp attack is like you make transaction on purpose and you play with the play with the timestamp which is in epoch and try to insert it inside the blockchain with the with the false uh, with the false uh, epoch. This is about this is a new type of attack which we think is an attack and is possible and we are we are trying to work out and uh, put some proofs here. We are trying to. 
we are trying to make some experiments and if we are successful probably we we will release it as as well and we will discuss more maybe next year yeah. so <laughs> yeah that's about the uh, time warp attack in blockchains i mean the the basic point here is that in the real world things are weird like you start doing research into malware it dev it doesn't always make sense there's always something really bizarre in there that you're not expecting and that's that's why i love uh doing uh, hacker research in general either because we find the weird stuff uh ourselves or because we find it in other people's work so sometimes I get bored in the evenings and I uh, make up uh, data visualizations. So we went through a bunch of ransomware and we decided, uh, you know, when I was at Cambridge, they, they talked a lot about the crypto wars, right? Ross Anderson and those people were involved in lots of arguments about the crypto wars, about uh, which ciphers might be backdoored and which ones weren't and whether or not we should have a clipper chip and all that sort of stuff. And I thought this was like a cute little example of a cipher war, like inside ransomware, they're fighting over which cipher is the best for encrypting stuff, right? And they actually have incentives for getting their encryption right, unlike the embedded firmware industry, for example. Um, sorry, that was unfair, but, uh, <laughs> but it's also true. So I wanted to know which uh, of these different uh, ciphers showed up the most. And you can see some of them aren't even ciphers, right? Um, there's like 7-zip in here, uh, RC4, oh, I guess RC4 is technically a cipher, but uh, not anymore. So the one of the most one it was used AES, which is a symmetric encryption. The property with the symmetric encryption is that you have same keys, and so the encryption is faster, and you have less computation. But the problem is the number of keys because it's it spans like n square because you need one key pair for each encryption. So the next thing that comes up is uh, RSA, which is public key. But the problem with RSA is that you need more computation and it takes a bit more time as compared to AES encryption. However, on this slide, what we want to point out is that from 2016, we see a spike in uh, how many people search for RSA on Wikipedia. So, which indicates like, okay, for us, it's, it's okay when we speak about encryption and things like this, but back there in my family, let's say my cousin brothers, they don't know what encryption is, what ransomware is, or something like this. They, they are not so technical as we, as probably we are. But if for, for, for common people, something like a ransomware hits, they give you, for your convenience, a link on Wikipedia and say, okay, look, this is a ransomware and this is a RSA technique. People start to click there, show, search it. Okay. What's, what's RSA is. So this is what we took from Wikipedia. We cannot, Go back be beyond 2016. Actually, actually, we can. It's just harder work. We haven't done yeah. it yet. Yeah. So uh, at 2016, we saw that okay, people are searching for RSA. So this is an indicator that from 2016 there was a rise in RSA in in the search for RSA, which probably indicated that RSA is being used, and we suspect that it is being used in ransomware. So However, we haven't done a mathematical correlation of this data to infections and payments yet, but that's one of the things we want to do. Um, but a lot of times in our research, we run into these anomalies, right? And so we're also asking you, the audience, does anybody know why this spike in 2016 occurred in, in RSA on Wikipedia? Of course, Irina. Um, can you shout it out? The Della acquisition of RSA. Ah, okay. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So we'll look into that and see if that correlates much better than uh, with samples, uh, which I suspect it will, right? That's why we asked the question. But it's also interesting that this is the time frame in which RSA uh, declines on Wikipedia searches and AES rises. So we're not just talking about this in a ransomware context. We're also talking about it in a crypto wars context. So like that seems to be a transition period where afterwards people are more interested, everyday people are more interested in AES. So... Symmetric versus asymmetric inside ransomware. One of the key elements, if you'll forgive the pun, uh, of the ransomware research that we were doing is the theory that uh, ransomware actually keys matter, right? If you screw up the keys, someone can steal the ransoms from you. Another rival gang can steal your money, right? Or the money you're about to steal from someone else. Um, that's not true. So like we talk a lot about incentives uh, in the Cambridge lab. And like I was saying before, embedded firmwares, if I screw up your router firmware and I don't get the keys right, you guys suffer the cost. 
I don't as a business, right? Whereas in this case, they actually have the incentives the right way around. If they screw up, they don't get their money and that's that. So we think in some cases, you see some ransomware where the encryption is very good uh, and those are the ones that continue to make money and don't get stolen from other people. So with that as a inspiration, ankit has been looking uh, at symmetric and asymmetric inside the, these things. The, the only thing I would like to say here is that they started to use a combination of symmetric and asymmetric because Symmetric gives you the speed and asymmetric gives you the more strength to encrypt the encrypt the files. So most of the ransomware we analyzed, they were using a combination of these where symmetric keys were generated locally while asymmetric keys were downloaded from the server. So it gives them a speed as well as the power to encrypt uh, power to encrypt the files more strongly. Okay, so now coming to the extortion. When uh, ransomware started, they give you multiple options to pay from. It included Cashew, MoneyPak, Litcoin, Bitcoin, and one of the most important criteria, uh, characteristics of all these payments is the, is the anonymity offered by these, by these payments. However, we can say these are not completely anonymous, but they are at least pseudo-anonymous. By pseudo-anonymous, what I mean is that they are not, the identity of the payer and pay is not visible. However, you can see from which address, let's say the pseudonym, a, the payment is made from and the payment is made to. So these payments are pseudo, pseudo anonymous and we tried to see in the blockchain to, to relate these pseudo anonymous names. We, our target was not to identify the identity of the, of the guys, but the only target was to, at the time of the research, was to identify the payments made to, at the total cost these ransomware made to us, uh, made to the society. So uh, on the screen you see the price of Bitcoin since it was started from empty Gox exchange. And with the increase in the price, you see the number of families surfacing on the internet. So number of families of ransomware. Number of families of ransomware increasing on the internet. With the price increasing, there we saw more and more uh, ransomware rising uh, here. The idea here is that, okay, when the price was increasing, everybody was talking about Bitcoin and people also started to copy, paste the ransomware. For example, Jigsaw has like thousands of versions because everybody was taking a binary and start just putting his own ransomware Bitcoin address and started to publish his own Jigsaw version under the name Jigsaw again. For okay. the deadline, the payments are generally few days, like, like three days or something, at max weeks but they allow you to have some extension at some extra price. And the payment addresses are generally single address, hard-coded or generated on the fly. Single address means, for example, not, not Petya, only use one address to receive payments. And the, the, the relation here from binary to address could be one to one or many to one. All the binaries of not Petya has one address. For example, uh, in case of WannaCry, it was hard-coded, there were some three addresses. It was supposed to do a on the fly generation, but because of some bug in the code generation, it was stuck to three addresses and only three addresses were used to make payments to WannaCry. So here the relation would go to one to one, one to many and many to many. And why does that matter to us, right? Um, the answer is missed correlations, basically. So if you've got a one to one binary to address correlation, um, then that will give you a different correlation structure than if you've got many to one. So like Jigsaw, with the reuse of addresses, it's very easy to see that across multiple binaries, which also makes it easy to classify, right? But where you do it on the fly, it's much harder to get a correlation between a Bitcoin address and binary to a family uh, from another sample because polymorphism, right? So that's why we're interested in that property. And one of the things that is fascinating is that uh, with Bitcoin, there's often generated new addresses because it's known to be not very anonymous. Uh, whereas uh, Monero, for example, is still perceived to be very anonymous. So people have a tendency not to regenerate Monero addresses in crypto miners and things like this, which makes it easier, right? You wanna go? As you wish. Okay, I'll go with the first one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So another thing that we discovered during while we were researching about this, that the people were targeting everywhere and CTB locker targeted websites, which is, I think, in my opinion, is not so intelligent because you take regular backups of your website. So if someday someone hits my website, I have my backup, I will wipe out my server and just 
put up the backup i mean i restore my website from the backup in this case we didn't saw many payments and interestingly ransomware has become a full-fledged business model which is offering you discounts if you write to them sometimes they offer you better customer support as compared to known companies for their customer support another thing that they are using is the pressure tactics which is called doxing so they say okay if you don't pay to us we are going to release your personal photos and videos online so better pay us and there is something that Aaron would like to say about it it's related to GDPR I think yeah so I think some of the the astute amongst you have been worried for a little while that ransomware using this doxing tactic could be leveraging GDPR fines right because you can be fined up to 4% of your business for uh, breaches that release all of this data and so a lot of us have been worried in this community that this ransomware would use that as a threat and if they charge slightly less than 4% then you're more likely to pay that than worry about going to the regulator but through some conversations we've had with a couple regulators in Europe, um, it's become clear that they would take that into account. So if you are in a position where you have a ransom and the threat is that they will publish the data, you can go to the regulator and tell them that this is the threat and they will take that into account at the time, at the point in time that you are uh, potentially fined and reduce any fines or remove them because you were uh, brave enough to come forward under these circumstances. So I think that's really important. I wanted you all to know about it and you can ask clever questions uh, of the regulators about it. So the, the final stage is the decryption and hopefully they will decrypt your file if you pay them, but there's no guarantee. For example, for, for the case mentioned in the reference six, that is Kansas Heart Hospital, the ransomware guys decrypted everything. However, in case of power worm, the, due to the mistake in the codes, the ransomware eventually destroyed all the files. So if you pay to pay to this ransomware, there's no guarantee. If your file would be decrypted or not. Coming to this point, uh, so ransomware guys started to prove their authenticity and saying, okay, pay us some amount, let's say $5, and we will decrypt five files for you, just to prove that they are authentic and their ransomware works. Sometimes they even release your master, master keys of, of, of the ransomware campaign after the campaign is over, and even rivals release your your the rival release a private key of the ransomware just to prove that okay the other guy is not doing good the funny thing is that with the thundercrypt uh, i think the 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 screenshot is visible yeah the thundercrypt was a campaign launched in thailand i guess uh, yes no taiwan it was in taiwan and the campaign was launched and the guy wrote to this this ransomware guy okay my salary is not even 400 dollars so do you expect me to pay you $400 to decrypt my system? And as a good guy, he said, okay, please pay me a coffee and I will decrypt it. So these are some fun things that we, we discovered during the presentation. In fact, that gets a lot deeper and it's really fascinating to economists. Any economists in the room? Raise your hand. No? One. Okay, fantastic. So I'm excited. We, I get excited about this stuff. We're probably the only ones. But they, we find examples, um, like I used to think, like many of the hackers in the room, Geography doesn't matter, right? Ransomware can happen anywhere in the globe. It doesn't matter. But it does matter in terms of prices because you can't charge people more than their average wage or they're not going to pay you, right? So there's a differential in geographical pricing for ransomware. There's also a few types of ransomware that do like A-B testing. So they'll throw out like three prices in a region and then based on which people pay more often, they'll adjust their pricing scheme. Right. So it's just like uh, Google or Amazon. Right. Uh, they're doing some differential pricing. So there's some clever economics going on in ransomware if you can get to this data. And I get excited about that stuff as much as I get excited about the, the reverse engineering part as well. It's probably worth saying this is from a sample set of thirty one thousand. Uh, 181 samples, which is remarkably precise, but it's because it shows up every time I run uh, the code across it. So, do we want to say something about OSs? We all know that ransomware affects every OS, right? Okay, that's it. we're we're done with the boring stuff. Let's get to the cool stuff. So, uh, Bitcoin ransomware is different than Monero ransomware, for example. Electronium is a new currency that I had run into recently on a miner. Uh, anyone heard of Electronium? No, same as me. So I was looking at a, at a miner, not very exciting, that was mining for Monero, 
And then one of its alternate configurations was to mine for Electronium, which is a, a variant of Monero. So like those of us doing ransomware research, we've got to up our game in terms of what uh, coins we're looking for, right? Because it's constantly changing and it's really frustrating. Uh, and it's fun to write regexes for those coins. Uh, top tip from our research, because they have validation and verification, you can do it much faster. Like looking for URLs and binaries, you never know. You get a lot of false positives. But if you code in the, uh, you know, the verification of uh, Bitcoin addresses or Monero addresses, it speeds up your code and you can work through lots of samples very, very quickly. In fact, I'll give you an example. Some of the code we're releasing as part of this work is up on GitHub. Uh, and I got sent uh, a disk image, a Kimu image of a miner, like the entire um, disk image, right? And they said that there was a crypto miner on it, and I didn't know where inside the disk image to look for the binary. You know, bin binary orienteering problem, like which one's the malicious one, right? So I run this code across the entire thing, and I find four Monero addresses. Two of them are legit addresses that are donation addresses for uh, GitHub project code, so it's basically the miner itself. Uh, but the, the other two were the sort of malicious uh, accounts, if you like, where they were trying to send the money. Um, but that meant that when I mounted the image later, I was able to find the binaries that I wanted because I knew where the uh, where the accounts were, if you understand what I mean. And that's where I discovered this electronium uh, stuff. But you're going to say more about the proliferation of different families. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the things we did in the research, and I'm going to give you details how we did our research. So when we started, we wanted to cover all the ransomware, but the problem is that how do we prove in academia that our research is legit? So what we decided to do is that we took all the ransomware which asked for money in bitcoins and at least one payment was publicly available because we cannot say okay we find this address and there is no proof on the internet so we get a hit by, by the reviewer so we only took all those all those ransomware which asked bitcoins and one public address available somewhere we started uh, with and we analyzed all these uh, ransomware which is which, which are shown by red flags and yellow flags and in this presentation i'm going to give you we are going to give you the details of the payments to the ransomware which are flagged as yellow so there will be total six ransomware we are going to talk about i just want to interject briefly and say when he says we in this context i didn't do this research this is the research he did with uh, academia and that's how i discovered what he was doing and it's super cool so enjoy so the payment analysis framework was with had uh, has three modules. First one is to identify the ransomware addresses. Uh, my version was different, and Aaron came up with a better version after we met with each other. And the code is available here on GitHub. Maybe if someone wants to take it, can go. That was and the code I was just talking about. But yeah. yeah. And the second module was to collect the data and generate a database. Uh, locally because uh, we want to analyze things and that's why we downloaded everything l on the local PC. And then finally, how do we classify? Because not all payments to Bitcoin addresses are ransom payments. So we came up with a, with a mathematical function to classify payments as ransom. Super cool. So how, do, how did we collect initial addresses? What we did was like, we collected ransomware binaries whenever it was available. We searched through knowledge bases. We read the reports from CTO and incident response team. We searched over online forums where victims say, okay, I'm hit by this and this is the address which is asking me ransom. And the final thing which might be not so convincing, but we believe people put their screenshot on image searching and on YouTube because people doing how to YouTube videos on everything and there are how to videos to show how to remove blah 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 ransomware. So we also try to search every possible video and we basically saw every video. So and for you image processing folks, there's a significant opportunity here to classify coin accounts uh, and addresses in images as yeah. opposed to in text, non-trivial. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's one thing that I mean we were thinking to do this idle way of doing image processing, but this was out of my capability, let's say. So we did it manually. Now, uh, once you find initial addresses, the point is what if you have initial addresses that does not reveal a lot about these addresses because not everyone is going to take a screenshot, put it online, or going to share these share their ransomware addresses by which they are hit. So how can we identify the real depth of these addresses? So I'm gonna, we, we have two things which is called multi-input transaction and shadow addresses. On the screen you can see the left side part which is multi-input transaction. So you have multiple inputs 
And on the right hand side, you have some output. I'm sure that this video, that this, that this image is not so clear. So I'm going to take an yeah, example. I'm a, and I'm a bear of little brains. So like <laughs> you've got a bunch of accounts so, and not every payment into the account is a ransom. And so what you're trying to do is classify which ones are ransoms and which ones are not and the, how the cash outs are working. So, okay. I'm going to put this first that let's say Aaron, every time he goes to a conference and he asks for honorarium, and just to keep a track of how much is being paid, how much is being paid from conference A and conference B. So he gives out one Bitcoin address to one conference, another Bitcoin address to another conference, just to keep a track of it. And just uh, because generating addresses is free, so you can generate as many addresses as you want. So Iron has, let's say, three addresses and each address has 500 euros or pounds, whatever you prefer. Yeah, and when euros. he goes back home, he has to pay a bill of 450, let's say. So he says, okay, I have five, 500 into three. I can pay 450 from one of the address. So he takes one address and it pays from one of the address and 50 change is given back to him. We will come back to this 50 change. And at the same time, I call Iron and say, okay, you, you remember me? I'm a poor guy from Italy. I'm doing my PhD and I need money to travel. And he, uh, can you please give me 900 pounds? And he says, okay, I, I have a lot of money. So I can give you back, give you this 900. So what he does is like, okay, I have, two more addresses with 500 each. So he clubs this amount, which is 1000 and gives and pays me 900. So the point is the moment he clubs these two addresses, it is assured that these two addresses belong to Aaron. If I see one of the address in the blockchain, I can retrieve the history of this, this known address. And I will see this address with this address where he paid me 900. The point is when you do multi input transaction, it is guaranteed that all the addresses on the left hand side of the, of the screen are yours. So when we had initial ransom addresses, we, we fetch the, we fetch the, uh, data from blockchain and we did like a recursive, recursive, uh, how to say recursive search. In, in mis terminology, they did enrichment on the payments to find yeah. new accounts and new payments. So this was one of the strategy to expand our address, address set. The second thing which we left before is like uh, the shadow addresses. Whenever you make a payment and there is a change, it's not returned to you on the same address from which you made the payment. It is given to you in a new address. So the time he paid 450 for his bills, he was given back 50 uh, in a new address. So if in a blockchain, if I see a new address, which was which was not occurring any time before, like, let's say it's a new address and no payment has been done before. So I can say, okay, this is a shadow address. So on the right hand side of the transaction, I see some shadow address, which belongs to him. So this way we took like one or two addresses and expanded our data set to thousands of addresses for each family. Exactly. So, you know, if you haven't had enough caffeine, they have a cool technique for finding more Bitcoin addresses from the other Bitcoin addresses and chasing these transactions. So we have about 10 more minutes to get through a lot of slides. So go ahead. Okay. So the second thing was to download entire blockchain, which is like over 500,000 blocks. And I was afraid because my server machine does not have enough space. So what I did is like, I use blockchain API from blockchain data, uh, blockchain.com now before it was blockchain info. And we crawl all the transaction, which were, which, which was related to the address of interest. Now, how did we classify a payment as ransom? So the ransom is asked in BTC in Bitcoin or sometime in US dollars. They can ask, pay me 300 US dollars or pay me one Bitcoin. But the point here is that sometimes people don't know how to pay 300 US dollars in Bitcoins because there is a fees associated with it. So when you want, when I want to make a super fast transaction, I need to pay uh, extra money over it. So I will pay 310 rather 300. In this situation, if I, if I just consider 300 US dollars, my, my, my results from from for ransom payments would not be correct. So what we decided to do is that to take into consideration the fees associated with every Bitcoin transaction and for Bitcoin and both US dollars, we did a conversion and using this for using this mathematical formula, formula we the, we derive the results for for our payment uh, analysis. Another key point here is that um, I was really impressed with Ankit and the rest of his team's economic analysis, right? Because you could analyze all the payments that were made to ransomware over time, 
and you could decide that they all cashed out at the peak of Bitcoin, and you would get a different number than if you decided they cashed out every day. So this team uh, did some analysis of max, min, and uh, median, or was it mean average, price? Average, average price, uh, for those mathematically inclined. Um, so, And then they used that uh, to assume that they cashed out on the same day of the payment, or they looked to see when the payments were made later on. Yeah. And then they could make an estimate of how much money ransomware had made. And I found that to be a better estimate than any of the other estimates that I'd read before. So kudos uh, to you and your team. Thanks. So uh, these are some payments I'm going to show here. So then we will conclude our presentation. Uh, it's column, it's aligned column wise. So crypto wall you see on the blue is a day to day payments. Uh, in orange you see day to day BTC payments and in green you see day to day USD payments. So these are the some payments that we discovered while we were while we were doing this research for and crypto wall for crypto locker yeah and we'll look at a few slides in a moment of this kind of data um, but the key concept I want to get across to you here is every other presentation you've ever seen of this type has been obsessed with how much money the criminals made it's the wrong approach like yes if you work for Europol or the police or something then this is important because it goes into your case for the rest of us we just have to pay cleanup costs so we're not interested in how much the criminals made. Like in economic terms, the economy the criminals behave in is uh, asymmetric to ours. They make a certain amount of money. It's different than the cost of infection to the rest of us. So we have to pay the cost of cleanup whether we pay the ransom or not. So we should be obsessed with the blue graph, not the orange or the green graph. That's the number of payments that were made. Why? Because if we knew the average number of people who paid a ransom per ransomware family, then we could multiply up and know the scale of, of infection based off of the ransoms, right? And then if we knew the cost of cleanup, then we could multiply that and we'd have the total cost to society and we could start talking about having the NHS of ransomware and might governments clean up uh, ransomware, right? So similarly for DMA and WannaCry, I think the same, uh, Crypto Defense and Notpetya the same uh, this is more important actually so, just before this one just very briefly so these blue graphs I also think there's a really exciting thing here different ransomware has different spread strategies so some of it is a worm some of it's a virus some of its affiliate could we by the ratio of payments and the delta of change of payments start to make an estimate of what their infection strategies are interesting idea for future research so just to sum, uh, sum up the payments, we see the here like almost 103,000 number of payments and almost 88.4 million US dollar values paid to these, uh, to these six families. But the point which Aaron was making is coming in the next slide, I think. Just keep yeah. the keep the number 88.4 million in your mind and I can just... Yeah, because I want to compare this. Uh, actually, before we get to the comparison, you had you had this point, which I think yeah. is funny and cool, so... Also, this thing, what we discovered is like, how many payments were made on weekdays and weekends. So what we discovered was like, more payments were made on weekdays as compared to weekends. We speculate the idea is people who are in personal capacity, like in my in my personal laptop i refrain to pay i would like to wipe out my system because i take regular backups however for organization who work for monday to friday they make payments on monday to friday so when we saw these payments we did an analysis considering the time shift of time zones and this is the graph which we saw so 80 percent of the payments were made on weekdays we do not claim any, any, I mean, we do not have any solid proof for this, but we suspect that most of the companies tend to pay for, for the ransoms. Yeah, it's correlation, not causation. Okay, so getting back to my basic point, there's a fantastic paper that inspired me when I was a researcher and when the first time I was invited to Hack LU by Alexander, uh, it was because I was put in touch by a researcher called Richard Clayton, who's well known in the incident response community and um, a generally fantastic guy to speak to. Um, and he wrote this paper that's kind of undersighted. It only has like 23 citations, which I think is disappointing. And it's called Might Governments Clean Up Malware? So go and read the paper. And in the paper, he talks about the strategy of how companies and governments might collaborate. So let's say the government funds it to some degree and a local computer emergency response team is willing to uh, clean up the, the malware of some kind. They might sell other services such as a uh, new antivirus product or a new computer or um, exfiltration uh, detection service, right? So they could make a little extra money off of this affiliate scheme while they're cleaning up the government or cleaning up the malware on a kind of government, you know, 
a fee, right? Um, and it's a great idea. So it shows like the average cost of cleanup could be like 90 US dollars for regular malware. This is, you know, before we were really talking about ransomware. So the cost might be different, but they can bring the price down by offering these extra services and making a little bit of extra money on the side. And he eventually comes to the conclusion that it could be done. Uh, the government's payment subsidy into the system might be 66 cents per computer, right? which is an extraordinary sum. So go and read the paper and decide for yourself. Maybe you don't agree with the numbers, uh, but that's the point. Maybe the numbers work in some way uh, differently, right? Um, so let's say he's crazy and it costs $66 uh, per computer, just to do the calculation, right? We know this calculation is wrong, but we want to talk about it. So we have the number uh, of, uh, in, of payments and infections. Uh, multiplied by what we think the ratio of people who actually pay is. Uh, and then uh, we have the cost of payment. Um, so this is, uh, you know, if one in 20 people pay all of the ransoms that we saw, uh, what is the cost to society? And this comes out at like 130 something million. So you compare that to what the criminals are making, they're making less money than they're causing us as damage in society, which is no surprise. It's classic externality in the economic sense, right? Um, so the economists are excited. But I'm also interested in whether or not we could create mutuals to handle this. So I go back to the insurance industry and I start to ask them and I start to find these numbers where NotPetya uh, is supposedly, NotPetya alone, one ransomware family, is supposed to have cost uh, the insurance industry maybe three billion, right? Now, those numbers don't seem to make sense to me, right? Why? Well, because people might be uh, ineffectual at cleaning up ransomware or the corporate level fees are much higher than the ones that we're seeing here. We know that to be true. When they charge a corporation a ransom, they charge a higher amount than some of the transactions we've seen here. The point is that there's a big differential here uh, and the insurance industry is still profitable after paying out $3 billion in losses, uh, which tells you something about the profitability of malware versus insurance. So... Uh, wrapping it up, getting into the final slides so people can have more coffee. Yeah, so what we discovered was like ransomware campaigns were just increasing day by day and even novice users can launch these uh, campaigns just by copy paste, simple copy paste. And for the insurance part, uh, do we need a, do we need our insurance or not? It's up to you if you would like to do an insurance or would you like to take a hit by ransomware? Yeah, I mean, keep in mind again, I'm not talking about corporate insurance. Like you could approach this as a socialized medicine problem. Uh, you could approach this as a mutual. You could find five other organizations that have a similar risk profile and put aside a little money for yourself for a rainy day when you get hit with a breach or a ransom. Um, and that's called creating a mutual. And I'm interested in those kind of not-for-profit insurance mutuals or risk captives as well, where you create a company to hold the money for your company in case of a rainy day. Um, does anyone actually realistically believe we can ban encryption on machines? Good, just checking, okay. Uh, and I have a book out in December, um, so if you wanna buy a book, that buys me a coffee and I'd appreciate that. Um, Ankit needs lots of uh, applause and support because he worked very hard on this and uh, I think did some great work. And I also wanna give a shout out to DJ Jackalope, whose shirt I'm wearing, because most of the research in this project was done listening to her music. Um, so, greets to her and applause for Ankit. Whoa, well, that's great. You were on time. It's brilliant. Um, you haven't had coffee. He's standing between you and coffee, but are there any questions in the room? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I had the question, like the, the amount uh, that undamaged uh, caused to insurance, the three, what, three billion, that side. Was that Maersk? Um, no, that wasn't just like when you say was that, that's all payments across the industry. It's an estimate okay. from a company. And like the estimate is better than some, but not as good as it could be. But I think the deeper question you're asking is what's the largest driver amongst exactly. that number? Yeah. It's Merck, not Maersk. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Maersk was something like a 200 to 300 million payout. We think that Merck. Like we're getting deep into some insurance stuff that I don't think everything else, everyone else cares about. But basically there's a difference between affirmative insurance where I sell you cyber insurance and then you have losses and it's within the policy. And then there's stuff where you have a regular policy that happens to have a cyber and they call that silent exposure. So it's an exposure you didn't think you had. Asbestos is a good example of it. So this is silent exposure, three billion. 
this is property and casualty that got charged with ransomware when they didn't think they were insuring against ransomware. 